thanks for your patience as we work on and hope we can figure things out with our uh, virtual presenter in time. Well, thanks everyone for joining. It's great to see such a big crowd on day four at 8.30 in the morning. We really appreciate you all turning out. Um, this session is going to talk about the economics of piped water supply, which is obviously a really broad topic. Uh, so we'll be having a series of speakers talking about different issues related to this topic. And we're bringing together the rural and the urban perspective in this, which I think is something we don't always do at this conference. So just a brief uh, summary of what's going to happen during the next hour and a half. Uh, in a minute here, I'm going to hand it over to Emily Bondin from the USAID, who will be giving us some opening remarks. And then we're going to have a series of very quick lightning talks. Uh, so we have four presenters ready to talk on four different topics. Um, we'll then break out into group discussions, and our presenters will be in different groups for those discussions. So if you do have questions for them, um, that will be an opportunity to really get into it, um, ask for details, and start to think about the implications of what was presented. So with that, I'll hand it over to Emily, a Water and Sanitation Advisor in USAID's Center for Water Security, Sanitation, and Hygiene. Thank you, Liz. All right, so I'll just get us started by discussing why is piped water on premise so important? Um, for some context, we're making pretty slow progress towards achieving safely managed drinking water services for all by 2030. Only 16% of countries are on target with that. Um, and, and safely managed drinking water is, is water that's available, free from contamination, when needed, and, on, and accessible on premise. Um, that, that part about providing water on premises is, is, actually, is actually really critical to <coughs> safely managed drinking water. So studies have shown that water on premise reduces diarrheal risk by up to 52%. And it's also really key for gender equity. Um, each, addition, sorry, each additional hour spent collecting water per week is associated with a 2% increase in the likelihood of injury for women and children. <coughs> also, on-premises water supplies have also expanded capacity for productive uses beyond drinking water, like gardening, improved hygiene practices, and lower waterborne disease burdens. So all these findings have pointed to motivation that USAID and other donors should increasingly invest in providing access on premise through piped water. Um, and so we've been responsive to this in our latest revision of our global water strategy. We've subsequently included a focus on this. And so under our objective two of our uh, water, global water strategy, strategic objective two, USA will work with partners to increase access to both basic and safely managed water services, decreasing the distance to point of access, um, improving water quality and service reliability, and also affordability of access. To do this and to reach people with progressively higher quality and more affordable services, USAID will follow the evidence that has shown that area-wide <coughs> actually do this the best, and um, we'll work with public and private sector partners to strengthen and develop service delivery models um, to do this, and piped water drinking services um, as part of those delivery models. So, um, however, there's a lot of evidence gaps in this space to be able to do this. We don't quite know yet what the life cycle costs are, what um, the affordability is, what the pricing structure should look like. And so this is part of our action research initiative, which is key for us for a number of um, research areas um, under our global water strategy. But we have two research projects working on this. One is real water, and another is urban wash. You've probably heard a lot from them in other sessions throughout the conference. Um, real water is focused on water service, per, uh, water provider performance, <laughs> water safety, and water resources. And urban is focused on the enabling environment small and informal service providers and source water protection and diversification. 
and they each have findings to share about um, filling these evidence gaps for on-premise water. So I'll just stop there and hand it over to the next presenter. Thank you, Bob. really commenting on the importance of this goal of reaching everyone with higher levels of service quality, bringing water closer to homes. So I'm going to turn now over to our presenters who will be doing our lightning talks. And we'll start out with a bit of a presentation on some of the costs and benefits of piped water, which I know Emily started to touch on, um, but the Real Water Project has been doing a lot more work on this topic. <laughs> So I'll hand it over to Kara Stewart, who's a senior technical manager at the Aquatic Institute, and she's currently the PI on a cost-benefit analysis of piped water on premises uh, under the USAID Real Water Project. My name's Kara Stewart. I'm the manager as um, was already introduced, and I'll talk a little bit about our real water work. Um, and I also just want to highlight that this work is uh, an extension on a, a foundation that was laid by James Winter, who is also for the base. Um, so first, just to touch on some of the added benefits that we found for piped water users of various types in um, our three study countries, which is Ghana, Zambia, and India, specifically the Tamil Nadu state of India. So first, just to state at the top, we're looking here at added benefits. So this is benefits that are um, on top of those that are experienced by those who go off premises to non-piped households. So that context is important that these are not cumulative, but um, those that are in addition to our baseline. So there are many documented benefits for on-premises users. Um, as been, has been noted, we focus primarily on time savings, increase in productive use of income, and an increase in water security as measured by the IOIS 4 scale. And so what you're looking at in this figure are our cumulative results, so added all of those benefits together. Um, and it's showing the distribution that we see in our three study countries for various on-premises users. So we have our various pipe water users. We have on-premises tab in the darker blue, gray. Um, neighbors that are going and using their, um, their neighbor's on-premises tab in the middle, and then standpipe users in yellow. And so um, you can clearly see that across context, the on-premises users do experience the highest cumulative benefit. Um, but for the off-premises pipe water users, it's a bit more context dependent, partially depending on how dispersed the community is, um, like that rural context is important for whether standpipe users or neighbors experience more benefit. So particularly in India, you see not a, a huge difference for off-premises pipe water users. And a lot of that has to do with the historical advancement of this context for um, supplying standpipes readily and having a, um, a less dispersed population. Um, so I also wanted to, you know, our project looks at life cycle costs, and so we have a lot more cost data to share, but I just wanted to highlight initial construction costs um, to provide a, a, a fresh perspective than some of our other panelists. So, um, this is the snapshot of, of the work that we're doing. Um, a quick overview of our life cycle costing systems. Um, we had about uh, 10 in each country, um, and the context behind these systems is quite different across the three countries. Uh, notably, India, the systems are much older and started with a lot less on-premises household connections, so 16% at like when they were initially constructed. And since then, all of them now have a primarily on-premises connections compared to institution and standpipe connections. Um, so that context is important also when you're looking at the initial construction costs. Um, so this is um, a log scale, um, and each one of these dots is a different system, and it's showing its per connection initial construction cost. Um, so the initial construction cost may seem higher than you would expect, but keep in mind, especially for the younger systems, that they're built with the intention to expand on-premises on connections. And so um, a per connection cost at a snapshot of time at initial construction is not necessarily showing the full cost effectiveness of these systems. Um, and we do see overall some cost savings in, in India, also with our recurring cost analysis. And then a lot of that has to do um, with some of the top-down, kind of nationally-led um, economy scale that were picked up in this analysis. So 
Right on. These are lightning talks, so okay, yeah, we got <laughs>
tariff, the PURC approved tariff of eight Ghana cities, the cubic meter. And the household expenditure on basic services actually <coughs> falls below the internationally approved tariff guidelines of 3% of household expenditures. And so you find out that more than 26% of households in Tamale cannot afford the tariff. Sorry, more than 26% of households in Kumasi cannot afford the basic tariff, and over 86% cannot afford the tariff in, in Tamale. And so the regular residential tariff exceeds international affordability, affordability thresholds because tariffs are just too expensive. And so I would want you to join me at my table where we explore the dynamics of willingness to pay for water services and inspire ourselves as to how we can design better equitable water systems for our residents. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Faustina, and I think um, really interesting to look at both of those issues related to getting people connected up front and then that ongoing payment. I think those are both really critical things and appreciate your pitch to have people come talk to you further when we have time for discussion. We'll move back over to the rural context now, um, and I'd like to invite up Richard Moore, uh, the Managing Director for NUMA, which is a subsidiary of Water4. Great. Thanks, Liz. and Urban Wash teams for allowing me to have a lightning talk with you guys this morning to talk a little bit about Water 4 and the results that we're finding as part of the work that we're doing to achieve and maintain financial viability of our water services in rural areas. Water 4 is a nonprofit based here in the U.S. that starts and scales durable water businesses uh, in Africa. We currently work in Sierra Leone, Ghana, Uganda, and Zambia. We have over 400 water systems under our management with 12,000 plus households connected to them. And as part of our work uh, within those countries, as we're looking at how to uh, first achieve and then maintain financial viability um, and some amount of cost recovery for the services that we're providing, we really have four big key takeaways here uh, related to that. The first one is related to the user experience in interacting with our business and our NUMA water services. So the aspect of convenience, so the way the, the actual household tap is designed, the prepaid water metering system that we use, and the way that our customers interact with our sales teams. And then on the reliability aspect of the work, uh, a key part of this financial viability conversation is ensuring that our water is always available. At any point when a customer turns on their tap, the water is flowing out and they're able to access the water that they need for their household or productive purposes. As soon as water is not available at the tap, people will go back to alternative sources uh, that you know, do exist within each of the towns that we work in and not utilize our service, which decreases the financial viability of the work that we're doing. And third, and very importantly to us, is that the water must be safe to drink. Uh, it must be chemically and bacteriologically safe to drink at the household level. So we do a significant amount of residual testing and E. coli testing as part of the work that we do to ensure and guarantee to our customers that our water is actually safe for drinking. Uh, by guaranteeing that and by proving it through all of the water quality testing that we do, the results and the reporting back to our customers and to the districts where we're working, Customers can then stop using all of the alternative water sources that they are using, sachet water, bottled water, refillable water, and so forth. Uh, that's an additional expense on the household. So when we ensure that the water's safe, customers are able to drop the purchase of those products and pay a little bit of a premium for the water service that we provide because we guarantee the safety of it. The third one here is a little bit cut off, fourth one here is a little bit cut off, but a market-based tariff for the water services that we provide. 
One of the things that we recognize at Water 4 is that the cost of delivering a service increases from urban areas into the most rural areas because of the, the replication and duplication of water system technologies and components. In an urban area, you can have a really large-scale water treatment system, large pipelines piping into town, but as you move into more rural areas, you have to have you know, the water source, the borehole, the things. Um, the solar pump, the water system, and everything that goes along with it, which increases the cost of delivering that service. So market appropriate and context appropriate water tariff is really one of the keys uh, that we've seen as part of this of delivering and maintaining financially viable water services. Uh, our water tariff rates across the four countries that we work in ranges between $1.20 and $1.50 USD. Uh, per 1,000 liters of water per cubic meter of water. That works out to just right around an average of two US cents for 20 liters of drinking water quality water that we provide. Thank you. Thanks so much, Richard. So we've had um, I think a nice summary of some of these issues from the service provider perspective, both rural and urban. And they've really focused a lot on tariffs. And so what do we get users to pay? What are they willing to pay? How do we set those tariffs? But as we all know from the plenary yesterday, there are the other T's uh, to think about. And so we've talked a lot about tariffs, but it's also important to think about taxes and the role of public spending uh, in water service delivery. So we have uh, George Joseph, a senior economist from the World Bank who recently led an assessment on global public spending, joining us virtually. Uh, so hopefully we've got the technology working at this point. Uh, George, are you able to speak? Uh, hello, good morning. Could you hear me? Yes, we hear you. Okay, great. Okay, shall I start? Yes, please. Okay. Uh, so thank you. Thank you very much uh, for this opportunity uh, to present to this audience. Uh, this report that we recently launched, which is called, titled Funding a Water Secure Future, which is an assessment, first ever assessment of global spending and global public spending in the water sector. Now, uh, we talked initially at the, uh, when, at the introduction about the lack of information and knowledge gaps that are prevailing in this in uh, in the sector, and one of them is on how much is actually being spent in the sector to have an have a better understanding of what is the gap, what is the spending gap that we have to we have to fill to achieve the ambitious goals that are set forth in the SDGs to achieve safely managed access to water supply and sanitation. So. So how, in order to know that, we need to know how much is actually spent to begin with. And there are, as many of us know, there are many estimates on the spending needs, how much you we require to reach these goals, but how much is actually spent. Mm -hmm. So we know that in the sector altogether, now looking at a number of data sources, including government budgets and uh, private, sec private sector spending and ODA and so on and so forth, we know that overall right now there is a... Um, Total spending about of about 164 billion US dollars in the water sector, and most of it is coming from the public public spending through the budget, which is about 86 percent, and the private spending part is very negligible, in fact, which is below two percent. So this is an important thing to uh, keep in mind that the government plays a predominant role in the sector. Now. So how much is the spending gap now armed with this information on how much is actually being spent? We know that the total spending gap is about 140 billion US dollars. To put this number in perspective, this is about two times the total total loans and grants that the World Bank provides, World Bank IF, the entire World Bank group provides in a given year. So that is the, the spending gap that we are experiencing in the sector at this point. So this is an important challenge that the sector is facing. But at the same time, what, is this, what does this look for some countries specifically or some regions? Sub-Saharan Africa currently will have to spend about 17 times more their current level of spending to, to fill these gaps. While some of the FCV countries or FCV countries on the average will have to spend about 
40 times more the current level of spending in the water sector to achieve the, the SDG targets. So these are quite lofty, ambitious targets as we all realize. But one interesting feature about the sector or one interesting um, uh, contrasting thing that we would notice is we are not able to use all the resources, all the budget that's available. Despite the, we know that there's a spending gap, we need more, but we are not able to use what we have. So only about 72% of the available budget is being used for the sector. That means about one fourth is left unused, left on the table unused. This is primarily due to the lack of execution capacity in the sector and which involves a number of factors, including planning, procurement, so on and so forth, which many of us here are familiar with. Now going from there to, uh, to, the, to another aspect, how about the productivity of the spending? And that too, particularly in the achievement of piped access. We see that the piped and access to pipe, piped water supply and, and sewer, sewer services, in fact, we are, the productivity is declining. We are able, a decade ago, we could achieve, when compared to a decade ago, we are able to achieve only 5% less of what we could, of access with the same level of spending in piped access, providing piped water access and sewer services. So there is definitely a decline in productivity, which is primarily driven by the, by, by efficiency factors, because we all know that there is a lot of technological improvement that's happening, which is reducing the cost. However, the, there are efficiency challenges that the sector is facing. And now next we, next we move on to how if, equitably the available resources are being spent, particularly since we talk about public funding, which is which predominate, which is a predominant, uh, predominant uh, contributor in the sector, we see this is something that is obvious to all of us that public spending um, in the sector mostly is urban biased and also biased towards a better, better or the richer sections of the society. So there is a need to target the public spending and subsidize subsidies to reach the most needy which is again, which we uh, just saw in the discussion on affordability a few min minutes before. So given all this, what should we do? We should really think about a, a number of aspects of bringing in more financing into the sector, but at the same time, we should think about spending it more eff effectively and efficiently in the sector. Now that entails a new rethinking, a, a fresh look at the economics of water on how we should think about pricing, how should we think about cost recovery? How should we think about second best solutions when most of the first best solutions are practically not feasible in the, in the real world? So let me stop here at this point. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you again to all of our speakers. It's incredibly difficult, I know, to keep to five minutes uh, with everything that you all have to say. So really appreciate that. Um, maybe another round of applause for our four speakers. It's such an excellent job with the lightning talk format. We've got plenty of time now to break out into some group discussions. So. Um, this might entail some moving around the room, but we're going to distribute ourselves into four kind of areas. So uh, we'll take the affordability group over here. Uh, and Madame Faustina, you can move yourself over that way and be the hub of that group. Um, costs and benefits, we'll have Kara over on this other end of the room. Um, cost recovery, so Richard's group, maybe you can kind of come here in the front center. And then in the back, we'll have a group talking about issues around the public spending uh, that George just raised. Mm -hmm. So, yep, feel free to move yourselves around. And each group will be discussing two main questions, one around what the policy implications are and what recommendations we might need to be making in the sector, and then what questions still need to be answered. Uh, you know, what future research needs and analysis needs are out there. I'll leave this up um, as we go into the group discussions. How am giving them? Uh, 20 minutes. And then there'll be a report out. Yeah, then we'll reconvene and discuss as a large group. a good learning experience, nonetheless. <laughs> 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 
great. hear me all the way over there? Yeah, questions to answer, we can kick off with the first one. Uh, what are the significations of the issue presented? And we can just open with the uh, for discussion. <laughs> I don't have the answers for this one. We have some thoughts on it. We work in the, the rural water space in Canada in particular. There's been some talk about you know, the Ministry of Water. We have recently done a CEI around that. We will have to do the Ministry of the Rural Space. I think the big concern that we realize is that we're in those spaces. We set the tariffs so low. So uh, it was on a sudden off that for a CDA. So I wonder if it undermines financial viability and therefore things that we would have wanted to adjust the tariff settings from rationale for investing that just wasn't possible because the data wasn't there. And it's so very tender of things. What else, you guys? I have a question back to you, Richard. Okay. Having three or four countries with their water capacities, what would you say from the issue? Yeah, there are some notable differences within the countries that we work. We also work in Uganda, so we're in a, in a similar situation as Uganda Water Project of kind of waiting to see like the policy rollout is going to look like what the implications are going to be. Namibia actually has a also, they actually have a really clear regulatory framework um, that exists within the country. So we have a formal PPP with the government, uh, with the regulator, kind of a tripartite agreement in place there. And as part of the market base, 20 years, 30 years actually. Um, it has specific KPIs and review points for us to maintain that at least the contract. Uh, and one of the things that we've done in Zambia is we've actually demonstrated the difference in costs from urban to rural areas and the cost difference that we have. Like we presented our books, uh, financial model, our email, you know, like everything to the regulator, showed them what it costs to deliver on what I was talking about today. Reliable 24 7 service and water that's safe to drink, and we've been granted some exemptions to the regulation uh, by presenting exactly things so clearly on uh, the market based business model. We have a tariff that is more reflective of the cost to deliver the service. So much red tape and barriers to have. Ghana currently has some uh, reforms and so forth going on as well. Um, at the national level, with 
national water policy. There can policy. be so much red tape uh, and bureaucracy associated. Uh, Ghana also has a local authorities act that delegates service delivery and uh, utility services to uh, district and municipal governments. So under that act, uh, we are able to partner directly with the municipality or the district uh, to set tariffs and other like regulations around uh, water quality monitoring and safety. We do work with the district or community. Yeah, I mean, when you're providing water, you're the sole provider of water. Um, He's asking, like, are, when we're providing water, a full provider of water within the district or within the community. Um, at a district level, there's typically several operators because districts can be quite large. Uh, so I can use Ghana as an example. Uh, we have the facilities there. Uh, there's a more urban area, and Ghana Water is going to be working in the more urban areas. CWSA is in most of the northwest towns, and then we're working in the small towns of a thousand thousand people on average. So you can, within um, within a single district, you have different pricing for services. So utilities do not commonly overlap with one another in the same town. So it's less common like within the same town to have different prices for utility scheme services. There's also private entrepreneurs that are providing service that have you know their own pricing about the call of water to fetch. So there's some of that uh, kind of the informal sector. How does your price compare is what I'm saying to the other It's higher. Like it's higher. Like 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 for the system that you want to install in? I mean, where do they come from? I missed the very first part. And smile, but I'm also assuming the same as So I'm trying to find out what you're using. Are you using like a line or PVC or type of uh, backflow preventers, things of that nature? Yeah, for sure. Um, we'd love to have like a full technical conversation, just a brief overview. Is, yeah, it's PVC and it's pipe is the main. Also, that we're using or piping supplies that we're using, and then the water systems themselves is sediment filtration down to one micron, UV disinfection, and chlorine residual is the most common. But there's additional water quality issues that will add iron and manganese removal. Actually, if there's taste issues, so it's our system is very modular where you can add different components to ensure that we're um, always meeting more people uh, uh, quality standards on those systems. We're working with you on this Okay, great. Just to follow up on the pricing, because my eyes lit up when you said like a dollar all the way to two dollar fifty. Dollar fifty. We actually in Ghana water when they the fra, the highest price for the upper block residentials is like thirty cents per cubic meter. Industrial customers is like seventy cents. I think it's amazing that you've been able to convince the regulator lets you charge like a cost reflector. That one is uh, there's not, easier. We could do that in cities. I mean, yeah. it probably costs a dollar. <laughs> 75 <laughs> to provide service. If they're doing doing the the no, no, no. Then we ask. That would solve part of the problem. As many as okay. Obviously, there's this. Okay. Okay. The, if you're running a business, the distribution network. So, in rural areas, we've done studies in Ghana. 90% of our customer base are in the bottom two well exactly. miles. Average monthly per purchases per household is around four cubic. Uh, by any standard, if you should selling water at two cents per liter, for water, that that's highly. It's both. I agree. I mean, there's no regulation. I was just wondering if decentralized very lawful decentralization law because this is regulation is coming from the community. But if there's an important bill that's in there, right? The services are the monthly bill and she goes and buys sweets. We started out it's allowing But she did convince you. I guess the next question is
<laughs> that fully covering I, I know the whole cost, yeah, that that including areas amortization and yeah, capital just, like, costs, like, does that actually cover the whole cost? I feel like there's just so much to do. Thanks for the question. So on the cost side of our work, I want to come back to the tariff. No, 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 on the cost side of our work, the, uh, the capital costs for the water systems that we're installing, the average across our businesses is 70% intake as grants and 30% as debt. Uh, so I mean, that's a key part to highlight. Our goal not even <laughs> Well, that? Capital cost. So the initial capital cost to install the water system, 70% grants, 30% debt service. We're on our way to viability. Uh, just three years ago, everything was grants. So we transitioned to, to take on grants. And then on the, the other side of the work that we do, which is like the water utility side, is all of our water sales revenue minus all of the costs of operating. So costs have been sold, operating overheads, depreciation, debt service taxes, that are then have some styles this uh, format uh, for our work there. And just to note, like on tariffs in Ghana specifically, when we started out in Ghana, our pricing was actually the same as other utilities. Back in 2016 and 2017, we kept up with 70% of inflation and currency devaluation. I have some experience show the attempts that we made to keep up with the economic changes in the country. Meanwhile, our public pricing has been static. I thought you were suggesting that the consumers, at least the first question about getting here, no, there is this there that I think also the clarity requirement is a really important issue too. One place in Zambia is like operating in Maryland. So basically you've got a public utility commission that wants to see all your numbers. And they're going to take those and say you're at a reasonable rate of return or you're not, and that's okay. Whereas in Ghana, you are important to with the local law, but the national laws are highly uncertain. Local law is a national law. That's kind of what we're because the decentralization act is a law. And it's not because they cannot afford it. It's because they know that fully the services are not reliable and the quality of the service is not how much they're So there are many dimensions of that which are not tariffs. Actually, it all comes down to the point of the all of your consumption gets charged at the high rate. So it's kind of a, so it also forces people who are people who are the poorest quintiles to under-consume. Right? Because if they were to consume even one more but they would be charged at the higher tariff for all of that. Take the box of bizarre. Yeah, I had a question just on affordability because I think an important part of what you were saying is that the quality aspects that make it safe drinking water was a, a huge added benefit to the consumer, which is maybe why they're willing to pay a higher price. But we've seen several studies at this conference that there's still a lot of distrust of piped water, even if it's guaranteed. So I'm curious how you know that households are not purchasing packaged water to drink, um, and how, and then how you uh, convince that people that trust in that. Yeah, Zach, thanks. It's a great question. So Zach's asking about, you know, there's a lot of distrust towards high water supplies generally, and like, what is our experience uh, on what customers to, to trust our service? Uh, we have a, uh, we've been working in Wasa East in the southern part of Ghana for quite a long time, seven plus years now. And really seeing that it does take a couple of years of reliable service, of proven consistency on reliability, on safety, for those consumption powers to change. As we've expanded in northern Ghana quite rapidly under enhancing wash, um, we've seen kind of a similar 
frame and timeline, uh, but tightened up just a little bit for customers to trust uh, that our pipe water is safe because pipe water is just generally known as unsafe. Um, but you know, there's quality testing and reports that we do. Like as our all of our team is out in the field refilling our water bottles with our water. You know, Any time that you know, Ahmed is in the room or I'm in the field, we fill up from customers' taps uh, our water bottles. So there's there's a lot that goes into it on that aspect as well as drink the water that we sell. Uh, our teams take refillable bottles out to the field, refill them back home. So I think we cut the, the level of trust in customers and communities this is a ton. Your um, revenue in water zero percent. <laughs> maybe a bit, maybe a bit of an exaggeration. <laughs> so we do prepaid prepaid water meters on everything at households and at all of our retail. So the only non-revenue water we would have is what we have a leaky pipeline. Well, that's what I'm talking about. We have a leaky pipeline. Contamination in the water line. So do you check the water at the uh, at the point of use, at the connection? And how often do you do that? Visual chlorine testing. That is a proxy for water safety. Maybe we do monthly E. coli testing. And a key part of like we designed our systems is constant pressure. So when you have 24/7 water pressure you have on. You know, it varies throughout the system, but the new target is at least 50 in some kind of on the lower end. This frequency of testing vastly exceeds the WHO recommendations for the U.S. The U.S. government wanting to spend this public money on, you know, the disability infrastructure. So, uh, 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 so they're going out and they're paying, okay, you know, you, staff person, get X many hours of time to last time we have, or last time we have, and then everything else. After, in the continuous placement, the when the parts were you know, maybe at the, the kind of uh, yeah. uh, so uh, uh, regular price, yeah. like our average price per yeah. water point yeah. to the yeah. 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 Okay, so yeah. is this an yeah. example yeah. of yeah. yeah. As the all of their own work. You can do everything yourself, right? You sink your own board. Everything is yours. And it's privately held on you guys still use government sort of rehab government assets? We partner with other uh, NGO as well that are only focused on uh, on rehab. One thing we uh, discuss as well that the pressure is on spending so much from the primary the, the sector. We partner with organizations that have pressure on spending capex, and we follow up with them by getting. The ONM system for the capex. Uh, no, I, I, I understand it. I guess I'm drawing a distinction between organizations that completely run their own assets and have complete control over those assets versus other organizations that take it assets that were there and you know are have a, a license to operate those assets, but either they're still government assets. I mean, there's a big difference between basically setting up your own utility. And trying to rehab government assets, and then sometimes it's unclear who owns those assets or how long. Uh, they're two very different models. Yeah, I need to be clear the policy. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, this is a very approach where they start from standards and they work backwards. So they are they held themselves accountable. They hold themselves accountable for full hardware 
that someone if I'm wrong, we have one out of 400. Yes, just a mess. So with our prepaid system, our customers can purchase water through USSD, like over their companies. We also have sales agents that go door to door on a weekly basis. It's a prepaid interaction, so it's not bill collection, but it's hey, would you like to add some more water to your meter, which is a more friendly uh, customer engagement than bill collection. What is your sense in terms of level of interest, the readiness, sort of the structure, legislation? I think that's all. That's kind of what I was saying about it. It's driven by two hours from capital. I have to admit, I have been picked up by the human rights to I have to admit, I'm not very familiar with Parliament's finance or anything related to it. I'm not sure. Generally, with we do a lot of carbon finance with clean cooking, but not with water. And generally, with water, the, the incremental money that you would make from it is not high enough to justify the upfront investment in the, um, the what's the term, the verification, all the things you need to do to establish that you can get carbon. Ready. It's very so expensive to do that up front. Now, if there was a protocol set up that made it much, much easier and much less expensive for providers to do that, you might get to the point where it makes sense. But right now, the economics just. I can't help myself. Please. Unless you are, unless you are solarizing a system that relies on fossil fuels, in which case it's really an energy play. It's not a. Unless you're solarizing or replacing your lights with. <laughs> There's no carbon being mitigated unless you're in Indonesia where everyone boils their water for food. Which is about the only place in the world. So I swear where it's not, it's not actually a carbon offset. So just no, note that. And there are places in Africa that, that what we're making, I think evidence actually got a lot of carbon revenues and that on the theory that you are offsetting boiled water, but the practice, the practice is, is rare. We have a, a second question. There's uh, what is a question that still needs to be answered? Or something else. I don't know how much this happened during the initial part of your discussion. But Richard gave a presentation a couple of days ago here, where there was a focus on God and on pricing. Got a lot. There was a lot of attention to covering and even, even generating returns for impact investors. Yeah, we heard George earlier in his presentation. Among other things, subsidies are all around us, and they're opaque, and they're fully distributed. So the question I was going to pose is, how should we think about, um, how should we think about, uh, um, uh, the role of, 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 of public funding with respect to delivery and how you are able to do that. Are we I don't know. I haven't really asked the question. But I wasn't sure whether that's something to address. Well, I, one of the things I talked about is that our capex costs, 17 million grants, 30 percent debt. So on the the debt side, we are directly putting that back to principal. We are depreciating the cost of the, uh, the whole water system as an asset uh, against our water sales revenue. That is kind of that's incorporated there and uh, accounted for. Uh, and then yeah, on our session yesterday morning, we were talking about, uh, or I guess one of the things I was talking about is the amount of 
money that exists uh, currently to go towards solving the water crisis. So about 25% of the resources that are currently exist based on current resource allocations by Western aid and public spending. So like that's a reality that you know we're faced with and we're looking at how can and how should that finances are fully control kind of financing on the question for really huge gap on the amount of financing that's needed for others who can and are willing to and then on that 25% of resource that's available, it needs to be used as smart, efficiently as possible to provide those targeted subsidies and grant capital. What's the question that's being installed? What's the show? The structure that's being installed on a boosted and ongoing basis for people who do it. In an abstract state, but still. Our question is: Are you going to be more efficient? Yes, I was just trying to relate what are the limitations you're having with respect to. Expanding your services vis-à-vis uh, -vis the eventual cost of uh, operations, people are to determine. Current limitations capital, additional grants and debt investment to scale services further. That's our biggest challenge and limitation at the moment. We spent the last two years really optimizing both sides of our work on the construction side and on the water utility management side. And we've got the construction machine built now uh, to scale up and we're currently looking to secure more capital. Are you borrowing the local currency or the hard currency? Yikes. Because of the local currency rates like Ghana, for example, the prime rates 39. I know that the term of your limited. I know they're called. We're doing them so we can show all the people. Reducing the that, that really brings in the need to maintain the water tariff at a cost when it's no, no, no. If you could, if you can adjust the water tariff to devaluation, you're okay. But that's all hard. I'm sure that was driving in the direction of uh, saying how many customers you're serving. More customers, the tendency for your tariff to be more. Yeah, expanding to a certain limit actually help in stabilizing the rates. When we compare with the public sector, because of the huge so much they have to they have to reach, which increases the no revenue water, you probably have limited number of places to reach. You can control uh, the no Yeah, there's no way. Yeah, thanks for your question. Uh, uh, environmental. I mentioned the first one last in a country like Ghana, there's 10,000 plus people. A lot of other things are. They think that's water supply. So, in terms of like market potential for us to expand, I would say it's really great. And that's just looking at how the other countries that are across Africa. Uh, one of the things that we have enough connections and enough. Uh, uh, market saturation to look at yeah. like a diffusion of innovation models. Kind of looking at your innovators, yeah. early adopters, early majority, late majority, and laggards, and how and when and why those different customer segments sign up for the water service. And as you would expect, on the first half of this diffusion of innovation spectrum, those customers are purchasing more water. We actually run into a scenario where as we begin to pick up the late majority, average monthly purchase volumes are below the total units, individual units, it's mixed, right? Uh, it's kind of like in the U.S., right? You could have a laggard and everyone could buy an iPhone and kind of come right. And there's some of that that exists. We're going to have to pull out of a basic thing as well. With Numa water, no. With manual drilling and hand pumping, there's a lot of we're yeah. doing manual drilling. We still do uh, manual drilling, but it's Sierra Leone and Zambia for our new water. We so, so we can get. Oh, so, sorry, we're going to give you two, two more minutes, everyone. Two more minutes, and then we'll uh, please identify someone in each group to do your report out, and then we'll have open discussion. Okay. You, you pose a question to the group.
Can I take a can I take a quick whack? Uh, one. Uh, first, I think we're very clear that they're getting a 70 percent subsidy, and I think the most important thing in this area is transparency. So, as you said in Zambia, you have to be transparent because there's a regulator like the Public Utility Commission where I live in Maryland that requires you to be transparent, which is terrific. But in a bunch of places, you don't have that. But I think the transparency. I think the second thing is you always have to have a sustainable. I said this at the market based sanitation thing on thirty on Monday morning. You have to have a sustainable financial model. That can include subsidies as long as you know where the subsidies are coming from and they are, uh, are they are you know you can count on them. Um, and if in fact, as they grow through economies of scale, they're going to be able to cover more of their capital costs with even now the debt. That sounds like a pretty reasonable model to me. But the transparency of what they have, as opposed to the transparency of what Donald Water has or these other things, is radically different. So I, I think the best way to answer that question is everybody's got to be very, very clear on what it's costing. It's a question on the financing piece. Uh, and I believe, Richard, you said earlier in the week that 30 percent debt is really to cover the cost of the um, I'm curious why, why you decided to take the debt on yourself rather than partnering with the Marks Finance Institution and using more like the water.org or household debt. Yeah. Management process associated with those. We did talk to some schemes early on. The cost of one mechanism is on the impact or is it I think, you know, is it water dog? Yeah, I think they're a bit better in terms of rates for customers. So we saw that, you know, for a customer to take out the finance of the $300. By the time they pay it back, it was $255. You want to put that additional cost on the customer. As we've made this initial move from all grants debt, some debt, there's actually really favorable debt out there from impact investors who want to see if something like this is possible. So we've been able to get favorable rates in this. We made a loan for something like the Madonna five, seven years ago because the entity wanted to demonstrate that we ended up First of all, when we did the loan, we immediately we have answered the policy implications. We knew any innovative, any new idea. About a 50 percent haircut on the principal. That's what they expected they would be able to pack. We took a haircut on the principal, and then we made it an income participation loan where they only paid us back based on um, an increment over um, their, their operating costs. But they learned a ton. <laughs> about what it meant to take on debt, and that's actually why we made the loan. Yeah. We want them to understand what it's like. When you talk about scale, does anybody want to represent the group in the three to out? There's potential for me to present some bias in. <laughs> it sure seems like this scale would be as as I did. <laughs> we know he loved being up there. We <laughs> did this for lots of reasons. A lot of people yeah, have a good reason. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'll do my best, but y'all will pop in. I'll continue to offer. Okay, very good. Good question. be very interesting. I mean, there's always extreme insurance, right? Because the first thing that happened in the project. Let's take the signs out of the well, no, it's really good. Well, no, but I that's what we found one is expensive. Hey, I know. I know, I walked up and I said, we both had it. So, right. I mean, when you look at really like total cost of the Check. 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 Okay, everyone. Okay, let's let's reconvene. No, no, no.
Right, I'm gonna just. If, if folks are gonna, folks should feel free to stay, stay in their seats or, or move. It doesn't matter. But um, but we've got about we've got about 20 minutes where we're gonna discuss this. <clears throat> Check, check, one, two, mic check, one, two. Hey, everyone. Okay. Uh, no, no, I, I'm actually, this is great. It is great to see that, that no one is, no one wants to stop talking in these groups because that's an indication that we've got good, engaging, lively discussion. That was the goal uh, of today. Um, so what we're gonna do, we'll, we'll ask for a short report backs from, from each group. Um, and then we're gonna we'll um, we'll try to also engage some sort of open plenary discussion. Just before I do though, um, Louis Borston, who I don't know if he's still here, um, and it's, it has and it's, um, drops wisdom um, every time I see him, um, made the remark that these these are so interrelated. These these topics are so interrelated. It's really difficult to discuss one in the absence of the other. Um, so. Um, but we, 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 we asked you to do that. Now is our opportunity to try to, try to integrate them uh, in open discussion. So why don't we start with the cost recovery group, um, who is the rapporteur of you? Sounds good, thanks Jeff. Is this one still working? No. Uh, I don't know, go ahead, can we take that one? All right. All right, I'll use this one. All right, so quick report out from our group discussion around the two questions that we had on policy implications of the issue that was presented. Uh, we had some good discussions around uh, the water tariffs in a couple of the countries that were represented here, uh, mainly Uganda and Ghana. Uh, we're, we work in both places. Uh, Uganda Water Project was in our group as well. Uh, just talking about um, you know the policy implications of national uh, policy coming out that sets uh, the policy for pricing and water safety uh, when there is a reality around the increasing cost to deliver water safely and reliably in rural areas. So, you know, a policy implication would be to at least hope that there would be able to be some engagement and interaction with the service providers and the regulator and national government as some of these changes are being made so that our organizations or businesses uh, do not cease to operate um, within our service areas. Um, a question that still needs to be answered, I think I've got a couple of them on here. We, we did have some good discussions. Jeff posed a great question to us and then bounced around uh, uh, like where does the financing come from for the work that we're doing. Um, so that's, that's something that's still um, needs more discussion. You know, is it going to be from uh, public finance? Is it from you know charity and aid? Where do subsidies fit into this? So that was a question that still needs to be answered. And then a good one from Lewis was on transparency um, around finances and financial models um, of different operators and of the utilities, so we can really see what it, it costs to deliver this service. Um, across the sector from different utilities and different service providers. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks so much, Richard. Um, why don't we go to Faustina's group? Um, so, who is reporting back? Faustina? Hello. You, absolutely. Thank you. So, in our group, um, we looked at some um, strategies that are already being done, but that needs to be improved upon. And um, the policy implication question, the first innovation that we discussed is to share information broadly through public education and awareness creation, and the need to bring together the <coughs> economic perspective, the social perspective, and then the engineer's notion of only infrastructure. Because water service provision is not only about infrastructure, but they need to consider the diverse needs, the abilities, and the, the constraints uh, to put together a system that people will have information and act upon that. 
And then the second is to expand the network to unserved communities to ensure accessibility, reliability, and service quality. And we all know that we don't have enough water available to serve, so there's need to reduce non-revenue water through uh, quick attendance to best and leakages and reduce illegal connections. And then, of course, also protect our water resources management. Erosion is creating a lot of mess in our water bodies. Uh, there's high turbidity levels. If we are able to work together with traditional leadership with NGOs and with communities themselves, we should be able to protect the water body so Ghana water or utilities can save costs on chemical usage. And then, of course, there's smart targeting of vulnerable households to benefit from subsidies. Because if you invest so much, you invest in treatment plants, in distribution and transmission means, and people are not connected, it is cost zero. So we should look at the people and make sure that they are connected to the network. And what is a question that still needs to be answered? That one. This man gave a very good point. I want him to explain himself. So <laughs> oh, okay. I didn't know I was going to be ambushed. Um, I was saying that um, Ghana Water is a private company. I mean, like, they, they, they have to make profit in a way. So the water is coming from the source, and they need to protect it. They need to get the communities together where the sources are coming from and work with them. Give them incentives and say, when you protect your water for us to treat, you get X, Y benefits. And then they can keep the place um, well protected. And uh, also getting the traditional leaders, educating people over the radio. How many people listen to radio interviews or discussions? But get down to the decentralized points and hold community traditional devils or anything with the local people and let them understand the differences, the cost-benefit analysis of investing in connection versus using a private source or maybe going to buy sashi water or anything. So that is just what, in summary, I have for you. Thank you. I hope I'm okay. No, you, you did very well. Let's clap for him. And you, and you mentioned benefit costs and benefits and how important how important that kind of calculus is and so I think that's a good segue to this group uh, over here Kara's group Thanks. Do we have any volunteers from the group <laughs> okay <laughs> yeah we had a, we had a very lively discussion um, on a number of topics not just these two but um, some of the policy implications are um, that we discussed are really you know, the, 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 the variety of service that we're providing in different areas in rural, in, in rural context, and how can we ensure like, equity and uh, a fairness across rural areas, and how do we motivate governments to, to invest in care, particularly in rural areas for on-premises connections. Um, we talked a little bit about um, different uh, actors and how they can influence tariffs. Um, and if there's political interference on tariffs, um, how much of, of on-premises connections are demand-driven and um, versus uh, kind of policy-driven? Um, and do we have enough data, or are there too many data gaps to provide the business case for on-premises connections? Um, I think there's still questions to be answered related to uh, additional quality of life benefits, um, some of the other uh, benefits that we couldn't model uh, due to, to data gaps and, um, and issues. Um, and how can we really isolate these added benefits for on-premises compared to standpipes, especially when um, service levels are so variable across contexts? Excellent. Thanks, Kev. Who is the, okay, great. You want to check if that mic works? Yeah, nice. Okay, well, I got very voluntold to do this. So I'm <laughs> <laughs> uh, telling my other group members to um, pop in if I need help. 
Um, so we actually had a really robust discussion that talked on a lot of things. Um, I'll mention one that we framed, we used some framing words of not only talking about the funding gap, which we talk about a lot, but also talking about the spending gap, right, at the same side, alongside uh, funding gap, really hitting on the, the points that the speaker, the lightning round speaker had shared around, um, you know, is issues with efficiency of spending and, um, and, and issues with procurement and like those types of things, um, capacity gaps to actually get public money spent. Um, so kind of all that, that's really where our whole conversation centered. So we talked, we spent probably most of our time talking about capacity gaps um, to, to you know, get public money spent. And so we talked a lot about training, uh, training and like questions around, that need to be answered around what is the best way to build capacity. A lot of projects take a, your, you know, a lot of programs projects take a project-based approach, which would maybe be a little more short-term. Um, output oriented, but is there long term and more program based approaches to build that capacity and uh, get spending gaps down? And what's the best way to do that? Um, we talked about things like procurement, oh, and workforce development was also in there, you know, like more create, you know, the long -term types of capacity building needed that might be really long term needs like workforce development. Um, let's see, and that it can be, I guess, on that point too, that it, this can be a very long journey. Um, and our folks are the folks who are able to invest in this, you know, invest public money is also willing to invest long term to build capacity to actually get the money spent in a meaningful way. And uh, we've also talked about how incentives um, to, for, you know, public funders, um, you know, what are their incentives in terms of like, you know, really interesting discussion at the end on metrics on terms of how much are they incentivizing money to be spent in impactful ways versus just getting money spent and out the door? And are we maybe leaving like, you know, getting the lowest hanging fruit, um, but really leaving communities who, or you know, water systems that are the hardest to reach or have the biggest gaps, maybe leaving them a little bit more behind sometimes because it's easier to get money spent in lower hanging fruit ways. And how might public uh, funders be willing to incentivize themselves with like measuring impact or measuring affordability or measuring low income or you know whatever that means. And so, and then a, a final point too that we talked about is that this is very much a global issue, very hot button topic in high income countries. Um, and so, yeah, definitely don't leave high income countries out of the, the conversation because they have a lot to learn and share and say about that. Yeah. Thank you. Um, th thank you all for these um, great report backs. Um, I think we've got enough to start us going um, for about the next 10 minutes or so. So I'll ask for hands. Who has something that they want to just generally share with the group to get some discussion going? Please. Thank you. So I was part of the public spending group and I think getting to the latter part of our discussion, one of the things that came up was the fact that the public spending was still um, providing access to people who already have access to water and for wealthy um, individuals. And for me, when we talk about metrics and indicators and reporting, one of the things I was wondering is how do we make sure that if we are reporting on gender, let's say, that actually the number of women who are being served are those who actually need it. And that we're not just checking that we've served women. What if we are serving a wealthy woman compared to disabled, widowed, poor women? How far can we disaggregate our reporting and the metrics that we offer to our sponsors and our journalists? I think that's very important when we're talking about affordability and public spending. Thank you. Thanks, that's great. Um, why don't we I'll just keep walking back. I'm really glad that you asked I'm really glad you asked that question. This this question I really do hope that we can spend some time talking about subsidy and public funding just generally. It's it's clearly the the, the um what links a lot of a lot of these uh these domains. Hi, Arsha Glenn from USAID. Um one of the things I think that ties everything together, um, and we haven't spent a lot of conversation on is the importance of providing services in the urban domain so that subsidies can then be used in the rural. Um, there is no way that the rural areas will be able to afford the infrastructure needed in these rural areas. So 
key policy issue would be ensuring that the urban space and the urban payers um, um, are getting water and, and good services while at the same time using the, using the um, benefits um, of overages to get the rural areas the water they need to, one, um, become more effective and efficient in food production. Um, and of course, their markets are in the urban areas. So it should be a symbiotic relationship. Um, and when, when one works, the other has a better chance of working. So I think um, in almost all of the issues on the table here, we need to elevate to the importance of ensuring that there is a continuum, financial continuum, rather than speak about rural versus urban. Yeah. No, I appreciate that. That's great. And, and this, this idea that um, about scale advantages and, and cross-subsidy is, uh, yeah, I think, is a really, really key theme. We, I don't know that we have anyone from Uduma here, um, Mikael Dupuy, but uh, in, in Benin, some of you may know that, that um, uh, there, are, there is a system of regional lease contracts. So rural supply um, is, is, is done through contracting to, um, to private operators who supply a third of the country. Each, each concession is a third of the country. So that, that, that um, gives you a sense of the kind of scale advantages that are sought. Um, but anyone on that topic or anything else, please. Frank Goldstaff from the Smart Center Group. Um, two things. One is rural water supply. Yesterday there was a presentation in the, in the tech show that claimed that rural water supply is possible at an average investment of $25 per person if you use the supported self-supply approach. So that is one. The second is quality of water. In this group, we had the example of Ethiopia. In Ethiopia, over 100 utilities who admit that they cannot deliver safe water 24-7 start to sell water filters as an additional service. So, is it not that I'm from the Netherlands? Last week I got a message from my utility that there is fecal coliform in my system. We are supposed to have the best water in the world. And even in Holland, we have fecal E. coli in the system sometimes. So is it not time that the utilities take their responsibility in the kitchen, into the point of use, and start to promote also water filters? We have a range of very good water filters now. So I think it is time to start and be practical and start to treat water at the point of use. Thank you. Thanks. Um, I, one, if, I, I think we have time for one more question or comment before I'm, we're going to hand the mic to Nebia Chemily from the Hilton Foundation, one of the key investors um, in, in water resources generally in low and low income countries. So, any, anyone else? Last one, please. Uh, I want to raise the point of cost recovery again because there's something that I think that we're not really discussed. Uh, uh, First is, uh, the, when you go to some place, remote place, first thing, uh, people don't even know how much the service costs, people in the utilities. So that's the first challenge that I have seen already. The second is, when you go there and you, they see where they're spending, they didn't know that small change could make the, the cost go very, very, could lower the price. For example, <laughs> energy costs, if you, if you know that we have problems with uh, reactive power, you can reduce the cost of energy really quick. So that's the kind of support you have to give to, to operators in places that are distant, that don't have access to all the information. So help them with the information. The second thing that makes the cost recovery most difficult have been raised here, that's the political side, because many times the mayor doesn't want to increase the price, increase the tariff, so how do you do that? My experience says, try to sell him the idea of having a regulator. And he always asks, why should I do that? And, and sometimes we say, because from now on you have someone to blame. You won't get the, <laughs> the wave of making the bad decision for the population. So that's uh, another way to try to recover costs. Thanks, <laughs> Thanks everyone. And for the discussion, Nabil, do you want?
Fantastic. So yeah, we're really pleased to have Nabil close us up. Liz, is there anything else? Okay. Thank you so much. So uh, I'm Nabil Shamani. I work with the Hilton Foundation. Uh, we work in Ethiopia, Ghana, and Uganda supporting uh, rural service delivery. So I, uh, colleagues asked me to just wrap up the sessions. We still have one minute. I think the main takeaway is that we haven't figured it out <laughs> yet. So there are uh, very good things going on in the sector. I, I think just looking at this from a rural perspective, uh, because it's about uh, the economics of piped water systems, we have uh, really to invest a lot, and this is what we are trying to do in uh, measuring real costs, actual costs, and looking at this uh, from a capital investment uh, lens and uh, operational expenses lens. We really need those numbers so that we can do proper economics and make decisions. Uh, so this is one main key uh, takeaway. The other one is that uh, in all the discussions, I think there's a consensus that uh, subsidies are required, and I'm not going to go into the technicalities, CapEx, OPEX, etc. cetera. Uh, there is a need for subsidy. So we cannot provide subsidies uh, from uh, public or from philanthropic or from private sources if we don't know what is the actual cost and what is the actual gap that should be filled through a subsidy no matter where it's coming from. And this is what we are trying to invest in with our very limited resources at the foundation in partnership with uh, other peer uh, donors and bilateral colleagues in the room. Thank you so much. Thank you, Nabil. Thank you. Yeah, we really appreciate everybody staying around. So, enjoy the rest of uh, the rest of your Thursday.
think it would be it needs to be really because we we have the push end incredibly should be done. Have a quick wrap on all of where we created a bus. That was a good Good session. Each time we do this, we get better. I'm waiting for somebody to actually stand up and say to Ghana Water.